The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Expert Insights from Around the Globe on Tailoring Treatment for Patients with Atopic Dermatitis. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash AYD 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, everyone. We are really excited today um, on this expert insights from around the globe on tailoring treatment for patients with atopic dermatitis. So the agenda. This is a case-based demonstration and instruction of global approaches to the management of atopic dermatitis and will incorporate it throughout the program using a theme and variation approach with us discussing different um, issues and um, uh, cases uh, for atopic dermatitis patients among us. We will assess disease severity and initiating treatment. We'll explore the use of targeted therapies to manage moderate to severe AD in adults and children, improving treatment adherence and engaging patients and caregivers in the care. So be prepared to answer follow-up questions throughout the program and after the scientific sessions. So now I will uh, start briefly on my thoughts on managing AD and how we should assess disease severity and initiate treatment. So again, I'm Emma Gartmaniaski. I'm coming from New York City. I'm the Waldman Professor and System Chair of the Kimberly and Eric Waldman Department of Dermatology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. We'll start with the, a, a, a little bit introduction on atopic dermatitis, although I'm sure that many of you are familiar with atopic dermatitis, but it's important to remember that this is the most common inflammatory skin disease. In both adults and children, the prevalence of AD is estimated to be 15 to 20 percent in children and 1 to 3 percent in adults, although in the United States it's higher, it's up to 7 percent. The disease course is commonly chronic in adults and more relapsing remitting in children, and the burden of symptom, symptoms can be profound, really impacting the quality of life of patients. It all starts with the intractable itch that patients have, uh, inducing sleep disturbance, but also depression and anxiety, and many other comorbidities. And systemic treatments are commonly used for the patients that have moderate to severe atopic dermatitis that is not controlled with topical treatments and that have impaired quality of life. In terms of distribution of ages, atopic dermatitis starts early in infants, but for many infants progresses to childhood and in teenage years and adulthood. And many times we also have it starting in childhood or in adolescence. And we even have cases that starts uh, start in adults. Uh, some examples, uh, many times we see uh, that atopic dermatitis involves the folds, as you can see here, and that's quite common in, in, in most patients, but you can see it very clearly in patients with lighter skin tones. And atopic dermatitis in darker skin uh, tones, very important to differentiate just dry skin in dark uh, skin or uh, black patients as compared to patients with severe disease. But it is important in, in black patients to uh, assess the disease carefully because we do not see the erythema that is so evident in a uh, lighter skin tones. On the other hand, they have prominent lichenification, really a, a very a prominent thickening of the skin in many uh, locations, unlike uh, patients with lighter skin tones. And also many times, particularly when they have resolved lesions, these lesions resolve with this pigmentation that we need to be really attuned to. And also they many times will have follicular or papular or namular uh, morphology that is much more prevalent in uh, darker skin tones. Now, um, just mild or localized AD, many times mild AD is a localized AD because body surface area is important in atopic dermatitis. And just some examples, depending on the skin tone, you see it in dark skin and you see it in, in, in patients with lighter tones. 
So you see some uh, hyperpigmented, hypopigmented, or just pinkish um, uh, erythematous skin, no crusting or oozing, uh, barely swollen or thickened skin. A moderate atopic dermatitis, you see more dull red skin, clearly swollen, raised or thickened skin with mild oozing and crusting that might be present. And severe atopic dermatitis, bright or deep red skin, very swollen, raised or thickened skin, and oozing and crusting may be present. And here body surface area does a, a come into play because the rash is often widespread. So we have several tools to objectively assess the severity of atopic dermatitis, the easy scale that is up to 72, and the SCORAD that is up to 103. And we also have the validated assessment for atopic dermatitis, the validated IgA that is also utilized in clinical trials. Um, that was recently uh, modified and it's being used now in uh, the VEGA uh, validated IgA in multiple clinical trials. And we have some subjective tools such as um, a quality of life assessment tools, DLQI, POEM, and a Proritus NRS that um, is very important because each is the hallmark symptom of atopic dermatitis. Now, when we consider atopic dermatitis, we need to think also about the comorbidities of patients and primarily the atopic comorbidities. And we need to remember that atopic dermatitis is the first step in the atopic march. And after the atopic dermatitis starts, many times it's followed by other atopic comorbidities such as food allergies that start around one year of age and um, followed by asthma and allergic rhinitis. And many times our patients will have more than one comorbidity. Now it's important to remember that there are several guidelines and also some um, uh, publications in lieu of guidelines such as the yardstick uh, because guidelines are uh, happening only once every uh, few years and they are not updated many times to include newer treatments. So uh, I participated myself in the AD yardstick that try to incorporate the newer treatments uh, at the time, such as dupilumab and a crisaborol that were not yet incorporated in guidelines. And the same uh, happens with the European guidelines. Uh, so on one hand, you have guidelines. On the other hand, um, you have some position papers that are trying to incorporate and newer treatments, such as you see on the right side, that are not yet part of the guidelines. So now let's discuss a case um, of a patient with atopic dermatitis that has widespread lesions in all over the body. The patient has atopic dermatitis since childhood. It was most of the time a, a mild to moderate, um, he was uh, able to control it mostly with topical treatments, but it got progressively worse uh, throughout life. And then it got much worse after the patient started to use multiple um, um, doses of oral prednisone. And um, um, after the oral prednisone was started, of course, lesions disappeared, but uh, eventually um, the disease got out of control and um, the patient, um, when I saw the patient, he was already on his fifth dose of oral prednisone in one year, a widespread disease, a crusted lesions, a weeping, and needed also multiple courses of antibiotics. Um, so what are you doing in such a case, um, Jacob? So that's a great question, and I think it's a typical case. Um, so basically what I always do, and that's, that goes for both children and adults, is I, I want to make sure that they adhere to the treatment and they follow all the recommendations we have. And I'm sure that in this particular patient, if you optimize topical uh, treatment, it won't solve his problem. But, but I always do that because, as I will explore later in my presentation, is that we do come across these patients that have misinterpreted and misunderstood uh, the danger and risk of using topical corticosteroids, and therefore they fail. But as I say to them, if the product doesn't come out of the tube, it's not going to work. But if, anyways, I try to optimize that. 
And if that doesn't, doesn't work, then I present to the patient the various treatment options we have. So I'll say in the near past, that has been the traditional systemic immunosuppressants, methotrexate most notably is the one I prefer. Um, we don't use cyclosporin that much in my country. And, and I think it has to do with, with um, you know, the brevity, we can use it. It's one to two years, and then you have to take the patient off. And, and basically what I look for is a long-term treatment solution. And now we have the Pulumab, and, and I think we have you know, several years of experience. It's, it's a wonderful drug that works nicely. Also have very good experience with methotrexate, as said. And now in Europe, we, we have the benefit of also having access to baricitinib. So, so those are the three uh, predominant uh, treatment options that I would consider in a patient, patient like this. And what would you do, um, a, for example, a patient that was on a, a oral prednisone, let's say you want to put the patient on the pilumab, would you do a, a small period in which you give both methotrexate and dupilumab just to take him off the acute exacerbation he had? Or how, how would you tackle this? That's a good question. I think the, um, the challenge here is, so if you have a patient on prednisolone, when, when removing that, we fear that you will have this flare. Um, the problem with methotrexate is it's so slowly acting. So um, likely there, I would prefer cyclosporin because it, it, it acts so quickly within a, a few weeks. So I would remove the patient from prednisolone as fast as possible, replace it with cyclosporin and dupilumab. But, but I must say, even though it has a slower kick in dupilumab compared to some of the new JAK inhibitors, I think it's, it has a, you know, sufficiently fast onset of action. So the bridging hasn't been um, that important in my clinic at least, but, but I'd be uh, very interested to hear the experience from Japan and from your clinic. Uh, Dr. Gottman. Yeah, and hey, Kenji, what is your experience in Japan with such patients? Yeah, so we have very similar situation uh, in Europe. Uh, we have very similar uh, guidelines, and also we have very similar um, <clears throat> choices, except uh, methotrexate is not allowed to use in Japan. But other than, other than that, we are exactly the same as Europe. And in my clinic, very similar to, to both of your clinics, what I would do in such a patient, I myself, um, well, I, I agree with Jacob completely about the requirement to monitor cyclosporin and so on, but since I don't use it for long term, I like to use it sometimes short term to put off fires like, like this one. So what I would typically do, I would put the patient on dupilumab, but I would add a cyclosporin only for a few weeks that I anticipated would be the exacerbation after the patient patient is stopping a prednisone, and then I would do a taper. So in four weeks, I'm stopping the cyclosporin, more or less uh, two to four weeks. And uh, also topicals, because um, I had many patients that the exacerbation was really remarkable. Even sometimes um, they had to get to the hospital with infections. That's why I, I'm a, a big advocate against oral prednisone. Um, like I tell patients, it's worse than a Band-Aid because when you remove it, it's really, you basically didn't do anything to help the patient. You just made the problem worse at the end of the day. So I, I, I don't think this is a, a good solution. And now that we have good drugs, I don't think we need it. It was good for a period of time when we didn't have anything to treat them. But now that we have other drugs, I think we don't need to go into that solution. Those are enormously good points. I'm just wondering, um, uh, Emma, what dose of cyclosporin do you use? Do you use a high dose or a low dose? Or how do, what do you consider? That's an excellent question. So I, I use a, I would go, I would start with the three to four milligram per kilogram in these patients. I would not go to the five milligram per kilogram because it will be hard for me to taper in one month. So <laughs> just because of that, <laughs> if I go longer term, then I will start with the full five milligram per kilogram. But, you know, in four weeks, it's kind of hard to start with the full dose and do the taper. So I, I kind of choose an in between and it worked for me most of the times. Yeah, but it's interesting how our experience is so similar, even though you see guidelines are a little bit different and uh, also the approved drugs are a little bit different in uh, most countries. We hope that um, uh, several drugs that just recently got approval in Japan and Europe will come also to the United States um, very shortly, the JAK inhibitors. There are some uh, questions um, um, that I want to engage the audience um, um, and you. 
So what do you um, do if you have a case where you're not sure about the diagnosis of psoriasis versus AD, like psoriasiform dermatitis? Um, I have many patients like that, um, I have to say, and um, many times I'm not doing a biopsy, but sometimes I actually uh, do a, a, a biopsy. In my clinic, I do a biopsy only when I, for example, I decided that it's likely atopic dermatitis, I will treat with an atopic dermatitis drug, it's not working, or the other way around, when I treat with a psoriasis drug and it's not working, then I definitely do a biopsy, and then I think we need to consider other diagnoses as well. But what do you uh, do in these cases? Well, I, I completely agree. The biopsy is not the answer. And, and I just think we need to acknowledge that there are these overlaps or patients that have a psoriatic phenotype. So their eczema is expressed in a different manner. And they're just not, you know, in the textbook categories that we like them to be in, but we have to treat them with what we have. So basically, uh, here, it, it's, uh, it's worth trying if it's more an 80, uh, uh, you know, distribution and, you know, pronounced itch, go for an 80 drug. If it's more psoriasis, not that much itch and, you know, a slightly different location, go for psoriasis drug. Yep, 100%. And Kenji? I agree. Uh, but in Asian, situation is a bit different. I, um, because the psoriasis, uh, frequency of psoriasis is much lower in Asian population, and it's usually uh, the, uh, the, the diagnosis of uh, psoriasis is quite clear compared to Caucasian patients. And another uh, supporting tool to make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis is we sometimes occasionally measure TAC, that is a type uh, TH2 chemokine, which is uh, approved by Japanese uh, government to measure. But uh, that it, it, I think it depends on the uh, country's situation. But in Japan, its uh, biomarker is quite useful. And Kenji, in what percent of the population of atopic dermatitis patients is a TARP um, a increased? And um, does it differentiate between patients, for example, with mild, moderate, and severe AD? Um, TARP is one of the biomarkers in, for some patients uh, TAC level is not so high in although the uh, clinical symptoms is severe so but uh, um, in, in a single uh, individual uh, the fluctuation of TAC usually um, proportional to the severity of atopic dermatitis so that is a useful tool but uh, TAC is not the best biomarker so far I understand. So uh, it may not be good necessarily to differentiate uh, among patients, but in a single individual, it's a good tool to actually follow long term. Got it. Yeah, no, I, I think it's useful. I wish we had it, but <laughs> yeah, I know it's only approved in Japan. But we do in the United States, sometimes we use LDH, for example, that is available. In, in, what do you use in Europe, Jacob? And nothing at all. We have the same experience. LDH is good, and we can see following the bilumab therapy, it drops. So I think it's 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 worth trying, but uh, we actually don't do it. Yeah, no, the same. So uh, uh, we talked about skin biopsy needs, and I think we are uh, really aligned here. But what do you do um, if you treated a patient um, with a um, um, moderate or even a strong potency steroids, topical steroids for at least six weeks or more than four weeks? Are you doing a biopsy if the patient didn't respond? So uh, first of all, I never use very potent topical corticosteroids to an AD patient. I, I really don't like that. The skin is so permeable. And I don't want, you know, atrophy. I don't want systemic absorption. So I just use potent. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't work, then I start asking about, you know, how much was used. Um, but, but I can't really come across any patients yet where when my nurses have, you know, uh, applied the, the, the topicals, that it doesn't clear. We can clear almost everything. It has to do with dose. And let me tell you, we use 25 to 30 milligram per day. That's a universal application. So it's, it's high amounts and then it works. I can't remember when it didn't work, but it's not a long-term solution. So Jacob, a question, a follow-up question to this, when you say your nurses apply, so you mean under hospitalization or day, day hospitalization? This is a concept that we don't yeah. have. In the United yeah, so it's, it's, it's day hospitalization. 
day hospitalization. So we have we 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 rarely uh, put anyone with eighty in, in in the awards anymore because we can manage it as as a ambulatory. And can you in Japan? Uh, nothing uh, really to add, but uh, for very top, uh, potent uh, topical steroid, we uh, use in a very acute, uh, exacerbated situation, but only short period. But other than that, I don't have anything uh, to add to Jacob. And I, I also agree, I think, um, and that's a very good point that um, usually when, um, particularly when somebody else applies, since it's hard to apply on areas like the back, uh, usually AD can clear, but it's not sustainable. People cannot continue applying a huge amounts of steroids all over the body. That's why we need these systemics in this uh, population. And I think after uh, several weeks that nothing changes, definitely, I think a biopsy, a, we need to think about because we need to rule out if you do not want to have a patient with a mycosis fungoides, a, a, a form of a, a skin cancer that a, a, you know you treated all the time with topical steroids and definitely you do not want to put these patients also on a drug like bupilumab or a, other drugs that are not suitable for for this indication so very important to do a biopsy when you yeah. are in love and in particular cyclosporin will you know elicit an mf so so be careful in elderly where you're not sure about the diagnosis, I, I wouldn't recommend cyclosporin. Yeah, no, 100%. And, you know, we, we all see these patients that have atopic dermatitis, but they also have a contact dermatitis. Um, and uh, both Jacob and, and myself, we are also uh, doing patch testing. So I, I, I have to say, I like to do patch tests in atopic dermatitis patients early in the, um, basically early in the game, early when they come to see me, because first of all, I, I, I like to determine whether it's AD alone or if they also have contact dermatitis. And, and for example, if I give them dupilumab and, and if they have facial rashes uh, later, I many times it is due to the contact dermatitis, not something induced by dupilumab. So uh, because we need to remember their AD will be cleared, but not the contact dermatitis likely. So I think it's important to do patch tests to try to differentiate what is their AD, what is their contact dermatitis, and um, uh, think about removing the allergen. What, what is your experience, Jacob? I completely agree. And especially you talked about adult onset AD, those that come with worsening, you know, late teens, early uh, 20s, that there I identify the, the, the contact allergens. Um, we all, and, and just a brief note on the immunology, I know Kenji will cover this soon, but we know that once you have this TH2 uh, mirror or a TH2 profile, then if you, if you patch test or you get contact allergy, that will just worsen that TH2. So uh, the skew is there, the immunological skew is there and all contact dermatitis would just worsen AD, but you can't really tell it apart. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. And Kenji? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, we often use contact uh, patch, uh, patch tests for uh, atopic dermatitis patients, and especially in adult onset, as Jacobs mentioned, because um, chronic contact dermatitis lead to very similar phenotype of atopic dermatitis, which is sometimes called uh, haptem uh, atopy hypothesis. Yeah. And and also, uh, some of the AD patients got uh, facial erythema after the dupirumab treatment, and some of the patient is a kind of contact dermatitis and endopic dermatitis mixed, especially uh, contact dermatitis to facial area. That is one of the possible reasons why some of the AD patients got facial redness after the dupirumab treatment. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. So now, Kenji. We would like to hear from you. What are your thoughts? Okay, so my name is Kenji Kabashima from Kyoto University. So today I'd like to uh, talk a bit about uh, my thought on managing AD, understanding targeted therapies, especially uh, in terms of adult and pediatric AD patients. So there are, um, this is a scheme of the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. We already know that IL-413 play a major role for the development of each uh, uh, atopic dermatitis, we, what we call type 2 inflammation. IL-413 uh, impair barrier disruption, impair barrier functions, and also induce itch, and also uh, 
uh, barrier disruption resulting in mic microbiome uh, dysbiosis. So we can say that all AD subtypes share robust TH2 activation. However, some AD subtypes may require additional cytokine target to effectively uh, treat the disease, such as possible IL-22 or IL-31. And so let me explain a little bit about the uh, effect of um, targeting uh, cytokines for atopic dermatitis. One example is dupirumab anti-IL-4 receptor, receptor, uh, IL-4 receptor antibody approved in US, UK, and other Europe, and also in Japan, and aged more than uh, six years of age with moderate to severe AD patients. Most common adverse side effect as we uh, described injection site, reaction, dry eye, conjunctivitis, peripheritis, hyperitis, or herpes. So the long-term use of dupirumab shows sustained efficacy and incremental improvement of AD signs and symptoms. This is an example of AD, uh, adult AD patient with moderate to severe AD, uh, phase one to three, uh, study were enrolled in an old study. And at week 172, every week 300 milligram dupirumab treatment lead to uh, 8, 98%, 94%, 82% uh, percent achieved 50, 75, 90% reduction or, of, uh, from, the, from the baseline in easy score and other uh, markers also um, proportionally uh, decreased. And this is a um, long-term treatment with dipirumab in patient with uh, age more than six and less than 12, week, 12 years with moderate to severe AD patient. Similarly, with adult, IGA-01 is uh, 44% and mean percent change in ease is, uh, reaches 85.7%. This is really remarkable findings. And another uh, example is uh, targeting IL-13 only uh, through Kinmap, approved in Europe and Canada and UK. And extra one, two, one and two study demonstrated that, uh, as you can see, you can see IgA01 is reached 15.8% uh, and extra two shows 22.2% of uh, IgA0 and one. And also EG75 reaches 25% and also 33.2%. 30 and most common adverse effects include upper respiratory tract infection and conjunctivitis. And another uh, drug targeting IL-13 is rebrikizumab. Similarly to uh, trarikinumab, uh, phase two randomized uh, clinical trials showed uh, effect uh, in atopic dermatitis at 16 weeks. IgA01 response is about 40% and EZ90 is about 40% with rebrikizumab 250 every two, two weeks. And the most common side effect, adverse effect, uh, include upper respir respiratory tract, infection, nasopharyngitis, headache, injection site, pain, and reaction. And another um, Biologics targeting uh, IL-31 receptor nemorizumab. This is an example of phase three clinical trial, um, modified ITT population. Change in VAS score is targeting each is 42.8% uh, uh, decrease of VAS uh, scratch um, score compared to placebo 21.4%. And uh, also, uh, change in bus score up to day 15 is 30.4% in nemorizumab group. And most common adverse effect includes uh, shown in this slide.
Sure. So, so uh, then uh, we, sh we should move on to the audience Q&A. And the first question is, uh, does the cytokine profile of AD change yeah. from use to adulthood? I think uh, Emma and uh, Jacob has a strong knowledge on this. So why, Emma, could you start? Of course. Um, yeah, no, this is, I think, a really important uh, question because um, we need to uh, treat patients with atopic dermatitis throughout life. And um, atopic dermatitis is a disease that is slightly heterogeneous. Um, while the type 2 immune axis or TH2 immune axis is a common uh, or commonly upregulated in uh, all the subtypes, uh, there are differences between um, um, infants to children, uh, adolescents, and adults. Um, and for example, the uh, TH17 axis is uh, stronger early on in life in uh, infants. A decreasing later in life. But again, I think the important thing for us to remember is that the TH2 axis is elevated across everybody and actually is elevated already at the uh, infant uh, level, um, including in non-lesional skin, not only in the lesional skin, but children that have it uh, or infants that have it moderate and severe, it's already elevated in their non-lesional skin supporting perhaps the use of a uh, systemics when you have a severe disease also in uh, children. Although in that population, sometimes we, we do manage only with topicals. So we, we need to think about that. Uh, what is your experience, Jacob? I second everything you said. The only thing I could add is that what, you, what I notice as a clinician is how flaring AD is in, in children. So there is something we haven't studied uh, sufficiently. I think what happens during these uh, moments of extreme flare, um, perhaps it's just that the, the threshold level for exploding is different, but, but something happens there. And, and I agree what, what's important for us as clinicians is that if you inhibit GH2 pathway, you will solve most of the problems of all age groups. But there seems to be something about the children, something with, uh, as you said, TH22 and, and 17, and it's just different. So what do you think are, um, how, how um, um, are you treating, um, uh, using uh, biologics and in general, uh, I think systemic medications in young population? What, what do you think are the advantages or disadvantages? Oh, good, tough question. <laughs> um, I think it's an advantage that we have something which is very, you know, uh, useful and efficacious and it's something where we can you know control the injection every other week and then you know uh, complete parental control and and also uh, you know clinician control some of the uh, the challenges is that it's an injection and some children this is really uh, not their <laughs> the, the first wish if you will and they would prefer an all solution yeah. But it's my impression overall that this, you know, goes very nicely and, and I have very few children that complain, let me put it that way. And also remember that they don't need all the blood monitoring, at least I don't monitor my children, uh, which I had to do with methotrexate, with acetyoprine, which we use, uh, not, not uh, too rarely we saw changes in, uh, in leukocytes and, and it's just so I think the trade-off is so good because of the efficacy of the polio map. So yeah, what about you, Kenji? Yeah, so in general, I agree with you. Uh, so biologics, dupidumab is uh, available for young, young kids, and this is very strong and uh, so far not so serious, serious side effect. So uh, compared to, especially compared to uh, oral prednisolone or other uh, or as, uh, immunosuppressants. And uh, maybe the another advantage is, uh, of using biologics is if we can treat uh, severe AD patients early phase, and they may, uh, which may prevent the uh, development of allergic or atopic match. So there are still, we, we still need more evidence to support this data, but we expect that uh, early, uh, in, Early uh, intervention of <clears throat> atopic dermatitis with biologics may prevent the development of other allergic uh, match such as asthma. Good point. I just want to want to highlight what you said about safety. Like it's it's a very safe treatment that that's incredibly important in pediatric patients. 
Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And what are you doing uh, with pregnant women? How, how would you treat a, a pregnant woman uh, with severe atopic dermatitis? Uh, for example, the Tiruma, uh, my feeling is that it's safe in pregnancy, but you know, there was not a formal study, so I cannot actually tell a pregnant woman, listen, I 100% think it's safe. It's just that, you know, there was not a formal study. So I myself would recommend phototherapy, but there are some pregnant women that would not stop the Tiruma. So what is your experience? So, so we studied, uh, you know, the nationwide use of various medications in pregnant women with AD, and we saw that they are treated with topical corticosteroids, phototherapy, as you said, and sometimes with cyclosporin. And those are the typical go-to drugs. Um, in the European uh, Atopic Dermatitis uh, Task Force, we actually published a paper where you can see all the safety aspects, and this is also what's recommended. Dupilumab is mentioned in that uh, position statement because we have no um, biologically or mechanistically um, reasons to believe that it could pose any problem for the pregnant. But as you said, Emma, it's not, there are no studies, it's off label. But if you have this very severe AD patients, then that has a consequence also. So it's a trade off. I completely agree. Yeah. So I, I many times uh, leave it to the uh, women. I tell them uh, that I had some examples of women that didn't um, stop the pilumab and um, I have quite a few and actually delivered healthy babies. Uh, there were some pregnancies also in the trials, but I say that I cannot actually uh, suggest it officially because, you know, it's not in the label. I, I totally agree with Emma and Jacob. And only uh, additional uh, treatment for uh, pregnant patient is uh, antihistamine, although we know that it's not so effective. Yeah. So what is the earliest age that you will put a child with severe atopic dermatitis on lutilumab? In, in, like, when would you give up on topicals in such a child? I think it's, um, it has to do with adherence. If you have good cooperation with the, the parents and, and they have understood your instructions and carried them through, then if that doesn't work, I think you should as soon as possible move to a systemic treatment, even though the child is not very old. So before deployment, we have children two to three years of age who are methotrexate, who are on mycophenolate, mofetil, um, cyclosporin, so very, very young children. And that has to do with the fact that this is a chronic disease. It has very, very tremendous negative impact on the child's well being and development. So, therefore, I think if we have good treatments, if they're safe, if they're you know, given in, under the right circumstances, there is no lower age, basically. Yeah, a hundred percent, absolutely. And Kenji? Yeah, so uh, I totally agree with Jacob, but the only problem and the only difference is in Japan, um, the Japanese government is not allowed to use it uh, less than 15 years old. But uh, I agree with Jacob, we, we would like to start as uh, much earlier age as possible. Yeah. I, I think so. Uh, myself, you know, I discuss it with the parents and um, many times I think the fear of some uh, parents are, uh, oh, doctor, uh, will my child need to take it forever? So I say this, we, we currently are not talking about the future, but we need to give the child the best um, option to potentially outgrow the disease. Um, and that means to treat it um, uh, well, look, the child is not performing well, um, uh, cannot sleep, the entire family is affected. So first I'm telling them, let's worry about what happens now so that your quality of life will improve, the quality of life of the child will improve, um, um, the child will perform better in school, and then we'll think about the future, but we need to think about a safe means to treat the disease now and um, for a period of time and then many times you know there is some discussion with the parents because they want to try to space out the drug more i'm sure you you have the same so it's we we, we basically say let's first control it and then we'll see and um, many times uh, they they like what they see and then they don't want to stop it anymore 
but in the beginning there is that negotiation <laughs> i think th these are universal uh, behaviors <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah so jacob why don't you tell us your thoughts on patient care that would be my pleasure. So I'm from Denmark, it's Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and the winter is coming. But here is, uh, before it comes, we can make this, uh, this presentation. So let me see here. Um, so basically, we have been across uh, already this about there's the patient and there's the clinician. So it really is a collaboration between the two, and it requires good communication and education. So patients, they should, you know, describe the problem. We should listen carefully and, uh, you know, very often give it time, especially with the first consultation. I think it's important to allow enough time to get a good relationship with the patient. Because remember, these have been sick, sick you know, uh, since very early childhood. And they have probably met a ton of doctors and have met a lot of disappointments. So I think... If you are one of the last instances or one of the uh, number 2000 doctor they see, it's important to build this relationship of trust and where they think you can actually uh, manage their disease and do a difference. They should, of course, uh, attend to the recommendations, but for you, it's important to really uh, be transparent about side effects. And here, I think it's important to show the patient that just because it's uh, in the SNPC, that there is a, a, an adverse event or side effect risk, you have to think about absolute risk. Is this something that will happen commonly or will it be rare? I think that's very important because patients just read some safety issue and they stare at it. They don't think about how frequent it is. Sometimes I even bring up, you know, the risk of flying. You know that you can have a, a an accident, but it's very uncommon and you don't fear it. That's why you get yourself into the plane. Then I think patients should be presented to the many options. And of course they should choose, as Emma said before, it's really up to them. We are, we're just a consultant in, in this sense. And um, then they can try it out and we should then try to adopt and, and you know, educate around it and, um, and, and, and give our expert opinion. And um, then that's basically it. And as I'll explore uh, on some of the next slides, we should actually also try to establish some uh, treatment uh, targets uh, to, to get the best treatment results. So what's important is to understand what patient needs are. And we have unfortunately very few studies that have examined this. Um, here is a, a, a very recent publication from Germany, um, a cross-sectional study uh, where patients were asked about their needs. And as you can see, itching is part of all of this. Uh, also pain, uh, which we know is closely associated now with itch. And then there's have confidence in therapy. Um, and then there is this, uh, you know, having control, regain control of the disease. And basically, I think this is important. We need something that reduces itch, long-term solution, and the patient can sleep. So that's the requirement of, of an AD treatment. When we ask the patient about how important it is for them to have a complete skin clearance or almost complete skin clearance, those are the exact wordings from the validated IGA uh, scale that, that Emma presented before. We've actually asked patients, 4,000 adults with atopic dermatitis about this, all seen in a hospital setting. And what we can see when we compare it to psoriasis is that there is a stronger need among AD patients for obtaining almost clear or complete skin clearance. And also we see a severity dependent association. So those with the most severe disease have the strongest requirement and desire for this. And also we see an association between hand and face eczema, probably indicating that these are visible areas that lead to cosmetic uh, complaints and, and, and sufferance. I mentioned topical corticosteroid phobia. This is very important. Here's a systematic review uh, published in, uh, some years ago in the JAMA Dermatology. And there is no um, um, uh, meta-analysis done in terms of getting a number. Well, what you can see is that topical corticosteroid phobia is very common. So we need to address this in most of our patients. Uh, of course, those with mild disease where this is the, the main treatment, but also in those patients with more moderate to severe disease where we have combination therapy. They need to understand it's a safe product, and you, of course, as a clinician, have to use it in a safe way. 
Now, some years ago, one of my colleagues made a very interesting study. So all uh, topical prescriptions in my country are, are collected at the pharmacies, and we can really see whether if the clinician has made a prescription, whether it's also collected at the pharmacy. And what we found out here was that eczema is actually one of the worst diagnoses uh, in terms of uh, patient adherence. And then we found some other interesting findings. For example, if it's a junior physician, the patient is less likely to go uh, pick up a prescription. We can also see um, here I have um, the initial uh, visit, there's a higher chance that the patient will actually go to the pharmacy and collect the, the prescription that you gave them. We can also see that for the youngest children, it's the worst. And basically, this has to do with the parents making a decision on behalf of their children. You know, a topical corticosteroid is not safe for my child. And then also, we can see that systemic, if you prescribe them a pill, there's a higher chance that they'll go collect it compared to a topical solution. So what happens? Well, I try to explain them how safe a topical is, or it could be a systemic treatment, but there's so much confusion. When they leave my office, the last thing they hear is the nurse saying, remember, just a thin layer. And then they have been used to all these different treatment regimens where we know, you know, noted on paper how you taper your treatment, and it just gets so confusing. And some physicians even recommend mixing it with an emollient. Now the steroid scare can actually be measured. And what's interesting is the pharmacist had the highest topical corticosteroid phobia. So what happens when patients come to the, uh, the pharmacies is that uh, they, some of the prescription gets changed or they get more warning about how dangerous topical corticosteroids are. And here in a study from, from I think it's from Belgium, um, about 40% of pharmacists actually reported that they would change the topical corticosteroid prescription. The good news is that the same authors made an, an additional study and showed that after education, pharmacists actually improved their, uh, the way of, of handling and communicating top component steroids. But let's move to systemic therapy in, in adults with AD and psoriasis. So this is a study from my country. We had 4,000 patients or adult patients with AD and 4,000 with psoriasis. And we examined the use of uh, of, uh, of the systemic medications to treat these diseases. And what you can see is there's huge undertreatment of atopic dermatitis, even when we looked at those with severe disease. And this is uh, based on a PO score. So the score at the, the severity uh, uh, scale that was introduced uh, previously by, by Dr. Gottman. In psoriasis, you can see that we have much better uh, treatment uh, prescription habits, basically. But atopic dermatitis is different. But now we have more efficacious treatments, we would expect it to increase, but we have to redo the study in some years. What's interesting here is also, if we try to look at the uh, DLQI, so that's the life quality of the patients, we could see that those with the worst life quality uh, of more than 10 on the DLQI scale, they also had huge undertreatment uh, of the systemic, but as you can see, systemic uh, steroids were used more frequently that some of the other recommended drugs. Now, again, this was made before dupilumab, so I hope that the, the data has changed when we, re, when we revisit them in some years from now. If we look el elsewhere, we can see that in France, for example, there's the same uh, undertreatment of AD compared to um, psoriasis and, and chronic urticaria. Um, so, the situation is like that. I also, I've seen study data from Israel showing the same pattern. So something uh, seems to be wrong with the way we, we manage AD patients. So we talked about communication. One important thing is also to start uh, defining a treatment target because I think that at least I'm guilty and, and some of my colleagues I'm sure also are of being used to just, you know, doing what was best, do with what you had and then try to improve. But now realistically with the treatments available, we can actually uh, define uh, more ambitious treatment targets and try to, uh, and, and, and try to struggle to get, the, and to get them and obtain them really. And this is not a new strategy. It's something that we have, uh, have seen before in rheumatoid arthritis and type two diabetes and randomized controlled studies have actually shown that it works. So if you have a treatment strategy, if you have a treatment target uh, defined with your patient, 
the chances of that patient ending up with a better treatment response is much higher than if you just you know, do what you usually do. And the way it goes is that you have an initial visit and then you define the treatment targets based on you know, all the communication aspects we have, we have covered. And then you, you agree on a date to, to see the patient again or a new appointment. And there you see, did we manage to get to that treatment target? And if not, should we change the treatment? Should we add something to it? And this is all something that you can do in your clinic, but we need to really make that treatment plan and target to achieve uh, these ambitious goals. So here is just an example uh, from rheumatoid arthritis where you can see three different studies that you show care compared to treat to target. It gives very different treatment outcomes for the patients. This is something which is increasingly discussed. The uh, European Task Force of Atopic Dermatitis have tried to do it already in a, in a, in a small letter to the editor. And within the International Eczema Council, uh, we're also discussing these aspects and, and hopefully we'll get some, some, some more data on this. And, and ultimately we need to involve the patients of course, because they're the one who suffer from the diseases and they have to be brought into that discussion. But that, this, is, this is something that takes time. And I'll, I think I'll just skip uh, the, the European Task Force of Atopic Dermatitis, um, uh, um, all the details, but just briefly say that, that here presented some of the aspects that could be uh, included in a treatment to target strategy. So it doesn't only have to be about eczema severity and reduction of that. There can be comorbidities that are important. Um, you know, that could be uh, work relations that are important or cosmetic uh, concerns. So, so many different things are part of the, the AD syndrome, and we need to, to integrate that in the treatment plan that we set uh, together with the patient as clinicians. So with that, I think uh, I will go to the, uh, the Q&A and see what we have. And, and I have some good questions I can see already. And the first question is, what is greatest barrier to treating teenage population? Well, that's a good one. Um, Emma, will you start with that? Teenage populations, how do you do? Yeah, so I, I think on one hand, uh, the teenage uh, population wants to get better or the adolescent that we have uh, in front of us. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of them are fearful of uh, needles. Uh, some of them are also afraid, um, oh, doctor, will I need to take it my entire life? Um, so I think it's important to spend some time with them and explain that this um, treatment, for example, dupilumab, a, a systemic treatment that is effective in this population, will allow them to lead a normal life. Uh, these are very important years for those teenage um, uh, teenagers that we are seeing. They need sometimes to apply to college. Um, there is all this um, peer pressure. Um, uh, the looks are very important. Um, so I think um, uh, the education is very important that this drug may actually help them in multiple domains, both socially um, with the education so that um, they perform better in school. I have to say that uh, once they they understand the importance of uh, being on treatment. They overcome most of the times the um, uh, fear of needles. Um, I have many adolescents that in the beginning they were so fearful somebody else needed to to inject them, and now no problems. They inject themselves. They even go to college and inject themselves. Um, so I think the uh, talking to them and uh, explaining the benefit of this treatment. And many times they ask, oh, but doctor, can I stop? So I said, listen, let's first treat it. Let's clear you. Then we'll discuss if you want to stop. And frankly, almost none of them wants to stop uh, the treatment. <laughs> That's great. Kenji? Yeah, so I agree with Emma. And another thing is, yeah, I agree. Uh, peer pressure is very strong for AD patient uh, in teenager. And also they are very... Um, very nervous about studying. So uh, they, for them, quality of life is very important, especially for the uh, preparation of uh, entrance examinations and others. So for them, um, control, uh, not to eczema itself, but also uh, quality of life and other aspects are very important. And another um, difficulty in Japan, not may not be universe, is uh, the relationship between teenager and their parents. So sometimes 
teenagers want to have aggressive treatment, but parents are very nervous or reluctant to the um, uh, aggressive treatment. So that sometimes that's a problem for us. That's the same. I was just going to say, this is something I find very important is that you try to find out who makes the decision in that family and that, you know, the teenagers hurt is because sometimes we have parents making all the decisions, talking on behalf of the teenager. And you have just this introvert teenager sitting there and waiting to, to get out of your clinic again. So very important point. Then there's a question, how would you treat an infant aged three months with severe widespread AD? So this is not uncommon for us. This is something we see. What do we do? Emma, what do you do? So, you know, I think what, what I would do in, first of all, in infants, we need to remember that topicals many times work. So of course I'll not run to a system with a topic, it was a, with an infant. So usually uh, I would start with a mild to moderate uh, steroids. Uh, I would use uh, some more potent steroids uh, in um, areas that are, let's say, like kinified already or, or thick for short period of time. Um, um, I, I advise parents to really maybe uh, utilize the treatments a little bit more aggressive in the beginning and then taper down. I, I kind of like that approach rather than the other way around. Um, I do also utilize bleach baths in this uh, population uh, for prevention, primarily for prevention. Um, and for many of them, it's enough, particularly when the parents are really vigorous about the applications. Um, but for some of them, they need other treatments. So for now, I am uh, sometimes doing phototherapy when the child is on the mom. Um, um, and for some, we need better treatments, a systemic treatment, such as a, a treatment like Dutiruma. Anything to add, Kenji? No, uh, for three months patients, three months kids, uh, we usually use topical uh, treatment, uh, maybe moisturizers with uh, steroid. But we start from a strong steroid and then taper as soon as possible. But that's, if it doesn't work, we may increase the um, potency of steroid, but we usually don't use other options. The same in my country. And I'd say, you know, we could refer to cases where, you know, the patients, uh, the, the clinician or the parents have been too afraid to, add, to, to apply the potent steroids. And just to give you an example, sometimes they can have very treatment resistant facial eczema. And, and then you need to go to a, a potent steroid sometimes to, to get control, even though, you know, uh, it's not what we usually do to put a potent steroid in the face, but, but this is what you got to do. You need to control atopic dermatitis and, and, and use what's there, because if you don't, you will have recurrent infections, you know, uh, desperate parents. So, you know, get control and maintain it. And then there's a question here, parents often, it's a long one, so, so hold on. Parents often seem to have a lack of understanding regarding the toddlers and infants that I treat for moderate to severe AD. I frequently feel that they don't understand how uncomfortable it is for their child. And as a result, it leads to some level of parental non-compliance with treatment. How can I combat this obstacle to adequate, treat adequate treatment? So basically it is, you know, parent parents that stand in the way for good treatment. How do we do? How do we integrate the parents in the, in the treatment plan and, and have their accept? You know, I think it's a lot of teaching and education. Um, and I, I have it all the time. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I would have parents come to me with very severe, um, severely affected children that is scratching my office that I feel like, um, you know, like the child is crying, screaming, itching. And the parent is coming so that I will format a, a, a list of foods that they need to avoid. For example, that happens, I'm sure, to you guys as well. A, I think it's a lot of education. I, in fact, I even explained to them, atopic dermatitis is the window to the atopic march. It doesn't start with the food allergy. It actually starts with the AD. That's the source that we need to treat. And I think that education is very, very important because Many parents feel, oh, we'll remove some allergen or um, a food and that the kid will be miraculously better. And I'm 
I need to explain, spend some time. I think the first visit is very important to spend some additional time with the parents. Completely agree. Kenji? I, I totally agree. And in Japan, sometimes we hospitalize patients, kids, uh, about a week, we, which we call educational hospitalization, how important the treatment is and other education. We spend about a week or so for their kids and also their parents. Perfect. So I think it's time to wrap up. Emma, you will do that, please? Yeah, absolutely. This has been a really great discussion. Really great discussion. So first of all, I want to thank my friends and colleagues um, that uh, um, um, uh, joined me in uh, this very important discussion uh, on treatment of atopic dermatitis and how we better care for our patients with atopic dermatitis um, at different time zones. Um, we are here from United States, from Europe, and from Japan. And we want to thank you and have a great day and good afternoon, depending where you are. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerreview.com forward slash AYD 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals.